Hello and welcome to the Humanities Research Group and tonight's presentation by Charmaine Nelson. Before I turn it over to Charmaine, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement and sincere appreciation goes to Vicki Leong who crafted the law school's land acknowledgement from which this is drawn. So we gather today in the notion of peace and friendship. The University of Windsor sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. As part of the University of Windsor community, the Humanities Research Group is committed in working to ensure Indigenous traditions and perspectives are fully acknowledged and respected in our teaching, research, and community engagement. And as a community partner, we, hear, we hope to share in the process of learning the stories shared in the Truth and Reconciliation Committee report, so that, as they point out, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples transform Canadian society so that our children and grandchildren can live together in dignity, peace and prosperity on these lands we now share. Also, as quoted in the report, by listening to your story, my story can change. By listening to your story, I can change. By making this land acknowledgement, we are showing our commitment to learn from our past in order to inform our future. I want to reinforce the message from previous years that HRG is not only committed to acknowledging our Indigenous heritage, but we include Indigenous stories and perspectives in our programming of events. And I draw your attention to the full HRG schedule featured in the Athenian newsletter and online. Today's talk also affirms the HRG's commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so I'm gonna invite Fordoza Kuzov to introduce our guest speaker, Charmaine Nelson. But before I yield the floor, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Fardoza. Ms. Kuzov is a recent psychology graduate at the University of Windsor, and she hopes to pursue a master's degree in social work. She is currently a student experience coordinator in the Office of Student Experience and has been involved with a series of events and initiatives on campus, such as coordinating the African Diaspora Youth Conference. She hopes to encourage those to reflect and chart out their future as well as develop a constructive and productive education and career plan. She was also the Jack.org event coordinator, as well as a peer support team leader at the University of Windsor for three years. And she hopes to continue growing both her mental health advocacy and community building. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm going to give it over to you, Fardoza, and I really look forward to this talk. Thank you, Professor Milgen, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for attending Humanities Week's first online session. Um, it is a privilege and an honor to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, Charmaine A. Nelson is a professor of art history and a tier one Canadian research chair in the transatlantic black diasporic art and community engagement at Nova Scotia College of Art and Design University in Halifax, where she is also the founding director of the Institute for the Study of Canadian and slavery. Prior to this appointment, she worked at McGill University for 17 years. Nelson has made groundbreaking contributions to the fields of visual culture of slavery, race and representation, and Black Canadian studies. She has also published seven books, including The Color of Stone, Sculpting the Black Female Subject in 19th Century America in 2007, Slavery, Geography, and Empire in 19th Century Marine Landscapes of Montreal and Jamaica in 2016, and Towards an African-Canadian Art History, Art, Memory, and Resistance in 2018. She has given over 260 lectures, papers, and talks across Canada, the US, and in Mexico, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Norway, Spain, the UK, Central America, and the Caribbean. She is actively engaged with lay audiences through her media work, including ABC, CBC, CTV, and City TV News, the Boston Globe, BBC One, Faker Fortune, and PBS Finding Your Roots. She blogs for the Huffington Post Canada and writes for The Walrus, and in 2017, she was the William Lyon Mackenzie King Visiting Professor of Canadian Studies at Harvard University. Now, without further ado, I am very pleased to welcome Charmaine. Thank you, Fardoza, and thank you to Professors uh, Miljan, to Professor Gomez, and very early on, it was uh, Kim Nelson who invited me to come. So I'm very happy to be with you all virtually. 
Um, and I'm really excited for the question and discussion section at the end. Um, and I welcome all of your questions. Nothing is too basic or too complex. Okay, so we'll dig in wherever you are ready to enter. Um, I just want to um, just say a brief word about terminology. I will be using the now outdated racist colonial terms like Negro and mulatto that I find in the archive. And I do so um, uh, deliberately because in Canada, we need a reckoning with the fact that transatlantic slavery is also our history. These terms were not imported from the USA. They were homegrown terms as well. And also uh, just a warning that, um, especially in the Q&A section and, and at parts in my, um, in my talk, uh, I may, um, we may end up discussing descriptions of sexual and physical violence, which were ubiquitous within transatlantic slavery. So I'll start now, and thanks to Professor Miljen for advancing the slides for me too, so I'll let you know when to go forward. Okay, here we go. So um, uh, next slide, please. So on the 10th of June, 1776, an enslaved woman named Florimel, described as a Negro, fled from her slave owner in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Next slide. Amongst the various details designed to describe and recapture her, the ad noted that, quote, she commonly wears a handkerchief around her head, end quote. Next slide. On the 29th of April, 1794, an enslaved Negro man called, who called himself Charles, next, oh, that, that's perfect, great, who called himself Charles, fled from his owner, Azariah Pritchard, senior of New Richmond, Quebec, who described him in part as, quote, speaks good English and some broken French and Mi'kmaq. They say Mi'kmaq in the ad today, we'd say Mi'kmaq, end quote. Next slide. Finally, when a man described as a Negro named William Spencer busted out of the local Montreal jail in 1792, the jailer Jacob Kuhn described him as wearing, quote, a round hat and generally a wig, end quote. In all three cases, or all three cases, are evidence of the multi-directional process of what is called creolization, in the transatlantic world. Although an often overlooked region of inquiry, these examples pulled from the Fugitive Slave Archive of Canada, and those are ads placed by slave owners when an enslaved person would resist through flight, so resist through running away. So these all expand at the traditional limits of the definition and study of creolization. Florimel's head wrapping, next slide please, Okay, perfect. Uh, indicates a continuation of the West African dress practice in the maritime province of Nova Scotia, combined with what the anonymous slave owner described as her scarred face and her broken English. The three identifiers seem to indicate an African born woman. English was the dominant European language in Nova Scotia, the one that slave owners forced the enslaved to speak. As such, other than a disability or a deliberate attempt to hide her fluency from her owner, Florimel's lack of English suggests a recent arrival and the lack of time to acquire a new language. Although Canadian slave owners documented the scarring of smallpox and other diseases of the body of the enslaved, next slide, in both slave sale and fugitive slave ads for distinct purposes, when combined with her broken English and head wrapping, Florimel's facial scars may have been those of the community-based ritual marking of scarification. Slide. While the concept of creolization can be used to describe and analyze Florimel's retention of African dress practices, Charles' indigenous knowledge expands Sidney Mint's bimodal definition of creolization to include a third racial population. Slide. Although Charles's acquisition of two European language, English and French, was normal for the enslaved population of Quebec, his ability to communicate in, communicate in Mi'kmaq at the time an indigenous language that had yet to be transcribed indicates his ongoing contact with this population and raises questions about the interaction and community building between Black and Indigenous people within Quebec slavery. Slide. Lastly, William's wig wearing reminds us that creolization was not simply about the ways that enslaved Black people preserved African cultural, material, social, and spiritual practices, but their ingenious adaptation of the European. 
David Wallstreicher has explained that enslaved Black people in the 18th century mid-Atlantic region of the USA, quote, had already learned the trade of wig dressing, which they employed on themselves as well as on whites of different classes, end quote. Like other northern or temperate climate regions, Canadian slave owners did not distribute cloth rations to the enslaved for the manufacture of their clothing. Rather, typically secondhand or old cast off European and indigenous clothing was given to the enslaved by the slave owners, making the distinctions in dress across enslaved and free populations a matter of the condition and not necessarily the type of the garments worn. The circulation of wigs, a part of this colonial dress, dress trade, was of importance to the enslaved for their own self-care and adornment practices, and also for their attempts to resist through flight in a world where slave owners customarily described the hair color, the hair texture, and the hair style of the enslaved fugitive. Williams' wig wearing and preferred styling was not necessarily an attempt at cultural accommodation, a valorization of European styles, slide. Two key factors must be considered. First, the symbolic power of wigs, their association with middle or upper class manhood made them a vehicle of class mobility. When Devereux Gerat, an 18th century white Virginian man of humble origins recalled his attempts at trying to improve his appearance in preparation for an interview for a schoolmaster position, he told of acquiring an old wig so that he could, quote, appear something more than common, end quote. Significantly, Devereux had purchased the wig from an enslaved man who he assumed had inherited it as a slave owner's hand-me-down. But while for Devereux, the wig facilitated his attempt to look middle class, was the goal the same for William? Although named as a Negro in the Montreal jailer Jacob Kuhn's fugitive notice, Kuhn did not explicitly describe William as a slave. Thus, while free black males in Quebec may have used wigs, like the free white Devereux, to dispel the assumption of their so-called commonness, enslaved black males likely used them to attempt to free themselves of the social stigma of bondage altogether. But seeking to look above one station was also dangerous for black people. And living in a society where slavery was legal meant that whites felt emboldened to accost and detain black people at will. As Wall Striker relates, a New Brunswick, New Jersey jailer placed an ad in a New York newspaper notifying the public that he had locked up two black men who raised his suspicions because they were wearing fine clothing. Although the two claimed that their Caribbean slave owner had died, their words were not enough, and the jailer appealed for the slave owner, his heirs, or others to come forward with evidence of their status. Williams' wig wearing may have accommodated and or resisted European and Euro-American styling practices. On a basic level, the hair texture of Black Africans often tightly coiled, fine and dense, created sculptural possibilities in styling that easily allowed Black people to mimic and even surpass the design and manipulation of 18th century wigs with their own hair. Indeed, as Shane White and Graham White have explained, quote, what appears to have happened quite often, however, was that slaves styled their hair to resemble the wigs worn by members of the dominant caste, end quote. However, William's hair color, as that of his fellow free and enslaved Black community, likely brown or Black, was not, by European standards, the right color, white or light, to become wig-like. Therefore, we should contemplate the style, color, and condition of William's wig in relation to his own hair length, style, texture, and color, and his personal desire for a specific aesthetic look and even a po potential social goal. Next slide. Often defined as a uniquely American, meaning continental, phenomenon, creolization describes the processes and outcomes of cultural and social contact and transformation 
that occurred within the overlapping context of European imperialism and transatlantic slavery. While scholars like Cindy Mintz offered a rather constrained definition bound by time and location, others like Linda Rupert have provided a more expansive description, which allows for the possibility of different stages of creolization unfolding over time. For Mintz, creolization was a discrete 17th century phenomenon lasting about half a century and, begin, and being uh, characterized, excuse me, by the plantation thrust through which the first large introductions of enslaved Africans were occurring, slide. Creolization for Mintz then is not merely the meeting of two races or cultures, but a meeting within the context of slavery, wherein the majority population was not only African, but also enslaved. His focus on specific Caribbean islands, ones where genocidal practices had led to the extermination of indigenous peoples, also allowed him to overlook their role in what in many regions became a three-way creolization process. Therefore, for Mintz, creolization could only develop from the initial interactions between two newly introduced foreign populations, European and African, only take place in tropical plantation regimes and only involve slave majority populations. So those are places where the enslaved black population became the majority. Mintz's definition was also logocentric, privileging the emergence of Creole languages, what he called languages of work, trade, or pigeons, as the heart of his investigations. Indeed, he argued that, quote, the sociological importance of these languages is exemplary. I think they are the best example we have of the process of creolization. They are languages of slaves in some kinds of interaction with non-slaves, end quote. Although I in no way wish to diminish Mintz's recognition of the central significance of language, overall, delimiting his definition in this way also impose boundaries and value judgments on the nature of slave life, social formation, and material culture that was deemed to emerge in his chosen context. And additionally, his temporal, climatic, social, and durational parameters excluded certain practices, customs, social formations, and cultural outcomes. For instance, since the slave majorities that typically emerged within tropical contexts like the Caribbean were normally rural or plantation-based, the type of emerging Creole cultural and material forms that were more common in northern temperate climate, urban-dominated slave minority societies like Canada would fall off the radar of his curtailed definition of Creolization. Furthermore, these same sites were where groups of enslaved Black Creoles typically met and interacted with other Black Creoles are also excluded. And the term Creole here meant in the British transatlantic and other imperial uh, worlds, simply anybody born in a colony. So when I say Black colony, I mean the Black people, free or enslaved, who were born in the Americas. So what blind spots might such a dedicated focus have produced? What other forms of communal cross-cultural work bear the evidence of creolization and merit our scholarly attention? Slide, please. I turn to Congo Square, New Orleans, where for decades, white observers tried to grasp the extraordinary cultural, economic, musical, and social phenomenon which unfolded between the members of the significant African-born enslaved populations of the city. Originally the site of a French fort constructed in 1758 under the Spanish and Americans, by the end of the 18th and into the 19th centuries, the public space had become a place of routine, large social and cultural gatherings where hundreds of enslaved Blacks congregated on Sundays to engage in singing, dancing, instrumentation, and economic exchanges all under the invasive gaze of white locals and tourists. In the latter category, the English architect Benjamin Latrobe took detailed and meticulous notes about what he witnessed. A British transplant to the American North, Latrobe's subsequent experience in a slave-dominated Southern society must have been, at least initially, disconcerting, 
especially in terms of the sheer number of enslaved people that he encountered. For my purposes, amongst his most compelling insights was Latrobe's recounting of witnessing a gathering of five to 600 dark-skinned or unmixed people. And in his own words, he said, quote, I did not observe a dozen yellow faces, end quote, in Congo Square, dancing in circular rings, which they defined by, quote, African nationalities and cultural groups, end quote. As another observer recalled, writing nostalgically decades after the events, slide please, on a Sunday afternoon, not less than two or 3,000 people would congregate there to see the dusky dancers. About three o'clock, the Negroes began to gather, each nation taking their place in different parts of the square. The Minas would not dance near the Congos, nor the Mandringos near the Ganges, end quote. Taken together, these observations are profound. In the less socially restrictive atmosphere of New Orleans, the enslaved mainly, it would appear, by complexion and cultural knowledge, African-born, were allowed to gather in large numbers a permission they seized upon to create a vibrant social and cultural force through which they remembered, practiced, and ethnically demarcated their music, dance, singing, and economic and food cultures. If those assembled still recalled who was Mandrango and who Gangas, and even remembered their ethnic animosities, then of course language too, as well as a visual assessment of the corporeal, biological and cultural symbols of their ethnicities was a part of these interactions and perceptions. But astoundingly, what becomes clear as well is that the size of the African-born unmixed enslaved population and their ability to congregate across households and plantations allowed them to slow the process of creolization, even as the retention of African culture was actualized under the evasive eyes of the white audience. It was the ability, for example, of the individual Mandringo enslaved person to leave their specific household in New Orleans and in Congo Square to know that they would encounter a Mandringo community that also allowed them to preserve the Mandringo linguistic and cultural practices on Sundays, even if their slave owner's household was bereft of other Mandringos. Therefore, the pigeon that emerged within the slave-owning households, Mince's work languages, did not necessarily overcome and replace, at least not immediately, the fully formed ancient languages of Africa, which the African-born had brought with them on the slave ships to New Orleans. Or rather, the work languages that the enslaved had to use within the slave owner's household or plantation, precisely because they were surrounded by whites and African people of other ethnicities, could be dispensed with on Sundays at Congo Square. But the implications of Congo Square, of course, transcend language and enter the realm of the material and the visual, which are more commonly overlooked in the study of slavery. The memory of ethnic specific and, um, specificity and animosity, so who would dance beside whom, may also reveal a delay in the production of enslaved solidarity, slide please, in terms of resistance across ethnicity within and across slave owner households and plantations. So I show you this example from Jamaica here because what's extraordinary is across the Americas, many slave owners, white slave owners reported and believed that African born people did not get along with Creoles, those born in the Americas, blacks and slave born in the, in the Americas. But here we have an example uh, charted by the slave owner of two black men running away, one a Congo, so one African born and one a Creole of Spanish town, Jamaica, meaning someone born in Spanish town, Jamaica. So I, I'm arguing that the opposite is happening then to what is being preserved in New Orleans potentially. But it is also then, it also signals the ways that the actual cultural practices of lyric creations and singing, instrumental music and dancing were being preserved as ethnically specific here back in New Orleans. The per permissiveness of New Orleans meant that the gathered hundreds or thousands laid claim to an active public memory of cultural practice and performance that was in the late 18th and early 19th centuries not yet creolized. Instrument making was also a part of this African cultural preservation. Slide please. 
Latrobe noted the attention to detail of a carving on a fingerboard of an African instrument. Quote, the crude, the rude figure, excuse me, of a man in a sitting posture, end quote. What is astounding is that in the physically and mentally brutal and exhausting world of the enslaved, the presumed owner of the instrument, the person Latrobe described as, quote, a very little old man, apparently 80 or 90 years old, end quote, had at some time in his life expended the extra mental and physical energy, not merely to make the instrument from a calabash, but to adorn it. What did the figure look like? What symbolic meanings did it bear? What knowledge of the man's specific African ethnicity was inscribed onto what appears to have been his prized possession? Next slide, please. Just as sites like Congo Square seem to extend and slow the process of creolization, places where slave owners prohibited opportunity for enslaved congregation and where the enslaved were in the minority seem to have accelerated creolization. The life and experience of the enslaved man known as Joe in Quebec City served to highlight this point. Joe's life was documented far beyond the norm of an enslaved person anywhere in an extraordinary set of six fugitive slave ads for five flights across nine years from 1777 to 1786. Although owned by the business partners, co-founders and co-owners of the Quebec Gazette newspaper, William Brown and Thomas Gilmore, it was Brown, five ads, and the local sheriff, James Shepard, one ad, who advertised for Joe's return, in the wake of Gilmore's premature death in 1773. Brown's rather meticulous notation of Joe's age, height, health, dress, language, language acquisition, and labor offer an assessment of Joe's adaptation to life in the British colony after his forced arrival. Profoundly too, all of Brown's ads for Joe proclaim his African birth. African-born people in Quebec and the rest of Canada were a minority within a minority. Slide, please. Data collected from Quebec fugitive slave ads that routinely included a place of birth or previous residence indicate that the enslaved Black community was mainly comprised of Creoles, people born in the Americas, including African-Canadian, African-American, African-Caribbean, mainly Anglo and Franco in origin, and others. Therefore, Joe, Joe's forced migration, excuse me, to Quebec City, one of at least two migrations away from Africa, placed him at an extreme disadvantage to be able to remember, preserve, and practice his ethnically specific African cultures, languages, and spirituality. And how do we know there's at least two migrations? Because the slave ships did not come directly from West Africa to Canada. So when you find an enslaved African-born person in Canada, you must understand that they survived the Middle Passage to so somewhere further um, south Canada, and then were disembarked and either forced through inland travel or put on another ship and sent to Canada. So that would have been the case with Joe. Slide, please. What Brown's fugitive ads instead document is Joe's forcible movement towards European cultural acquisition in dress, language, and labor. Slide. As Joe aged, the Gazette's readers were witness to his transformation. In the first notice, so this is a detail of the first notice, Joe was described by Brown as, quote, a Negro lad about 20 years of age, about five feet and a half high, end quote, who spoke English and French tolerably. And in the last notice, slide, as, quote, Negro man slave 26 years of age, about five feet seven inches high, speaks English and French fluently. Every notice placed by Brown described Joe as born in Africa. And while the no first notice gave no indication of the labor that Brown and Gilmore stole from Joe, who repeatedly fred, fled from the printing office, in the last notice, astoundingly, Brown claimed that Joe was, quote, by trade, a pressman, end quote. So he was working on printing the newspapers and other things that they were printing in the office. 
Brown therefore not only documented Joe's transition from early adulthood to manhood, his aging and physical growth of almost seven inches, but his forced language acquisition and literacy in not one but two European languages and his journey from beginner to fluency. In a world where slave owners spent considerable energy ensuring that enslaved people were barred from access to literacy, Joe's likely forced literacy was extraordinary. What is more, Joe's literacy as a vehicle for his labor in the printing office had always been a calculation of Brown and Gilmore. A letter dated April 29, 1768, slide please. Here's an excerpt from the letter. From the pair to their mentor and former employer, William Dunlop explained that having been embarrassed repeatedly by the supposed insolence of the Canadian boys, quote, we are at last come to a resolution of trying to get a Negro boy, wherefore we beg you will endeavor to purchase, us, um, purchase one for us between 15 and 20 years of age, fit to put to press, end quote. Although the fugitive slave advertisements printed for Joe clearly de um, declared his African birth, the letter makes clear that this was never the pair's intention. Indeed, their text specified their desire for Dunlop to send them a country-born or Creole enslaved male who had survived the smallpox and, quote, can be recommended for his honesty, end quote. The bluntness of their letter positions the prospective enslaved black male as a product they were ordering for which they could define its specification according to their needs. Their desire that this so-called Negro boy be Creole speaks to their alignment with other slave owners across the Americas who assumed that African-born people who often had a memory of freedom would be more resistant. Joe's Africanness was at least initially at cross purposes with their intended exploitation of him in the printing office and necessitated what was most likely a very deliberate and aggressive technical and linguistic training to make him fit to put to press, one that likely subsumed him in various forms of European and Euro-Canadian culture and society. As an African-born male whose linguistic journey presumably initially included no European languages, this could not have been easy for Joe. Compared to the African-born enslaved people at Congo Square, New Orleans, Joe's life demonstrated an accelerated creolization under the pressure of Brown's and Gilmore's economic and cultural imperatives, a creolization that we can literally trace in the ads that Brown placed to recapture him. To my earlier point about Charles, Joe's creolization in Quebec also included his contact with Indigenous people and culture since Brown reflected that Joe fled wearing Indigenous footwear, quote unquote, Canadian moccasins. Slide, please. So due to their climates, the practice of slavery, the makeup of their enslaved populations and the ratio of, uh, ratio of the enslaved to slave owners, Canada, the American North and places like Argentina would not fit Sidney Mintz's definition of creolization that I, I discussed with you at the top of this lecture. What is more for Mintz, one, once one or more generation of these newcomers had already uh, experienced this cultural blending and biological blending, the term creolization no longer applied. To be clear, Mintz, is plain, Mintz plainly stated that his interest was in understanding, quote, what the original process of creolization was, end quote. But if the heart of his definition is drawn out, the cross-cultural and cross-racial interactions between enslavers and enslaved, which resulted both in new institutions and new cultural forms, creolization could indeed be said to have transpired in both non-tropical and non-plantation contexts, some of which were home to slave minority populations, places where the enslaved were outnumbered by whites and indigenous people. An expanded notion of creolization must also contend with the presence of, uh, uh, sorry, presence as ghosts or as colonized or enslaved peoples of indigenous people who in sites like British Quebec were enslaved alongside people of African descent 
hence Charles's knowledge of the Mi'kmaq language. It is this expansion and rethinking of creolization that I seek to undertake, not only in the realm of location, population, and climate, but also in notions of duration, speed, process, and outcomes across the realms of visual and material cultures. Regarding duration and speed, the nature of enslavement for the enslaved African-born man Joe led to a compressed period of creolization documented in William Brown's Fugitive Slave Ads, which demonstrate Joe's accelerated European language acquisition underpinned by his exploitation as a laborer in Brown's printing office. The language skills that were typically attained by enslaved people across generations were not at all given Joe's linguistic abilities transcended the re- given sorry that Joe's linguistic abilities transcended the realm of everyday spoken English or French in Quebec and that he was unlike most enslaved people most likely literate were forced upon Joe within a restricted time frame starting in 1768 location 2 calls to be further complicated as my discussion of Joe's enslavement in Quebec in the congregation of enslaved people in New Orleans Congo Square reveals, enslaved majorities, typically enslaved in semi-tropical or tropical plantation contexts, had more African-born people and accessed greater opportunities to assemble with people from their own ethnic and national origins, either on or off the plantation. Comparatively, the largely urban enslavement of enslaved Black minorities in places like Quebec was dominated by Black Creoles who typically forced who, who typically forced to live within the homes or in a lesser building on the property of their slave owner, like a cabin or a barn, suffered under the weight of a heightened slave owner and white community surveillance and were faced with far fewer opportunities to congregate away from white oversight. As regards population and process, if allowed to congregate, the numbers of enslaved people in Quebec could never have matched that of New Orleans Congo Square. And the process of creolization would have been severely transformed since any congregations in Quebec would have been dominated by black Creoles and could not have centered to the same extent ethnically specific African cultural practices since African born people like Joe were a minority within the slave minor- minority. Of course, the location and the climate had much to do with why such dramatic differences occurred across these sites. This research then is a beginning, a rethinking of the concept of realization to reconsider its viability for places like Canada and enslaved people like Joe, typically overlooked under or unresearched and misunderstood within the dominant tropical plantation landscapes of slavery studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charmaine. That that was um, that was fantastic. It um, really gives us a different perspective on slavery in Canada and also this this space. I'll let uh, Fredoza um, manage the chat. Maybe she can ask the first question. But um, we encourage everyone um, to ask a question. You can ask a question in the chat or you could raise your hand and Fredoza will will call on you and you can turn on your, your camera and microphone if you feel comfortable. Yeah, um, so thank you again, Charmaine, for such an informative and eye-opening presentation. Um, just listening to you speak on how that this behind transatlantic slavery in Canada has been, um, and looking at, even when I was reading your bio beforehand and, and going through the amount of education and experience and travel you've been through, um, I just wanted to get a better idea, especially from a student perspective or alumni perspective, um, looking into getting into the work that you do, um, kind of going step by step as to your own personal journey, um, doing this research, um, traveling as often as you were, going to Harvard as the Lion Mackenzie King visiting professor, um, just kind of your perspective as to how your experiences was, um, uh, maybe the trials and tribulations you experienced throughout the past few years. Oh, thank you, Fardosa, and thank you all for being here. 
So, okay, so that's a nice big question. Okay, to start with. Okay, so how would I answer this? Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know much about me, it's, first thing I'd say is that my all three of my degrees are in art history, which is odd for someone then who is a transatlantic slavery scholar. Most of my uh, colleagues who study transatlantic slavery uh, one, they are um, historians, and two, they focus on tropical plantation um, sites like the American South, like Northern um, South America, or like the Caribbean. So I'm kind of odd too, Varzosa, in that um, coming up through art history, what brought me to the study of slavery, because oddly, I never studied slavery. I've never had a class with any professor or teacher on slavery. I had to teach myself. But why I was motivated to do that is because... Um, I started um, my undergrad at, uh, I, well, did my undergrad and my MA at Concordia in art history. And in various classes of Western art, be they Canadian or, you know, French or some other European nation, they would typically show us images of black um, figures or black um, sitters in a portrait, for instance. And the professors didn't know how to talk about the black people in the images. So I'd always pose the question, you know, Fardosa, but... To their credit, they never said that's a bad question. They'd say, I can't answer that question. By all means, please pursue that for your final research paper. And I did. And in doing so, Fardoza, what I realized is there's a whole field called race and representation. Many of the people contributing to that field are art historians. And much of the research is on Black subjects in Western art. So I found my people. But what I found out is that my people, in terms of my network, in terms of who's doing the research, were not in Canada. And um, many of them were focused on um, art coming out of the USA, okay? So from there, then, the journey really was to educate myself to who was doing the research, how can I get this training, and how can I learn then about transatlantic slavery as someone who wants to talk about then this historical art? Because for, for those of my Emmy was on 20th century Canadian painting representations of Black women, okay? But what I noticed then is I could not understand those images, let alone things from the 19th and 18th century, without understanding slavery. Because those same images from the 20th century still bore the legacy of slavery or were created in the wake of slavery in terms of how they racially stigmatized and hypersexualized the black women in those images. So in order to fully grasp that, I had to go back to slavery to understand what that was, to understand the production of blackness and black femaleness in the context of slavery, if you will. So that has been my journey, but much of that has been then through doing my own research, understanding what it meant, what um, archival sites, which books, secondary research I had to read, which museums I had to go to, which art objects I wanted to look at, but then really immersing myself in the literatures of transatlantic slavery and figuring out, sadly, who's missing from that, those, that field is a, people studying Canada, people studying the American North, people studying these so-called slave min minority sites where the weather was cold. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. If, if what you're looking for, especially for your education, isn't where you currently reside, you have to kind of figure it out and go and see where you can learn more. So thank you so much for answering. No um, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat. I don't see any um, questions. Oh, someone has their hand up. Uh, mm -hmm. Jacqueline, feel free to unmute. And I'm going to turn my camera on because I know that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> um, Thank you, Charmaine, for such a fantastic um, introduction to, to transatlantic uh, slavery, but also um, as, a, as a preface to the research that you're doing at NASCAD. So again, this mm -hmm. is historical research, but yeah. NASCAD as, a fund, as an art institute, ultimately. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. how, if you can speak a little bit about the work that you have started at NASCAD and where you hope to go with that in, in such a very, it's, it's such a specific geography and, and, and institution. Um, yes. So I'm curious thank about you. that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jacqueline. And thank you for letting me see your of wonderful course. smiling face. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. So, okay. So here's the thing. If we think as Canadians, for instance, what do we know about slavery, slave, trans like slavery anywhere? Most of us will recall a film, right? So people go, oh, I saw Amistad, or I saw 12 Years a Slave, or I saw Django Unchained, or I saw, you, you know, if you saw Gone with the Wind, you're in trouble because that wasn't slavery, right? That was white nostalgia. But still, people go back to a film. There is no film on Canadian slavery, right? So here's the thing. 
if we don't get the artists involved in this conversation and in this production, we're never going to get a broad Canadian popular consciousness that slavery happened in Canada. Because sad but true, and we all just understand this as academics, the average Canadian will not go and find our academic books, right? And we can understand why. They're, they're, some of them are very difficult to read. They're hyper theoretical or overly conceptual. They're not written for the general public. The general public doesn't know how to find them. And, and if they found them, sometimes they wouldn't want to read them. So how do we get a general public awareness? How have they done that in the USA? It's because Hollywood makes films about slavery, many of them horrible, many of them inaccurate, but more and more accurate and more and more um, legitimate productions now, especially the, the more recent ones. So for me, NASCAD was kind of a no brainer because it is an art and design university so that the Institute, what I'm trying to do there, Jacqueline, so we, I'm very happy to say we just welcomed our first cohort of fellows. Because we're in the middle of a pandemic, there's these five wonderful people are virtual. But amongst the, that group, we have um, two artists in residence and three grad student fellows. Yeah, it's wonderful. So three PhD students and two artists. So they are all in some way either doing work directly related to Canadian slavery and or comparative work with slavery in Canada and some other region. So across the board, then I want to be able to do that year after year. And I want to be able to add the postdoctoral fellowship. So you wonderful professors who already have the PhDs or your terminal you know, degrees can come out and have your space, your office, your desk. And then Jacqueline, my dream is, okay, what happens when the MA student working on New Brunswick slavery gets to actually have a coffee and a chat with a PhD student working on PEI? What kind of sources did they begin to share? What kind of stories did they begin to tell? What kind, like, when did they start to say, did you know about this archive? Do you know about the site down the street? And here's the thing, because Canadian slavery studies is such a small field, and literally, Jacqueline, you probably know this, there's a handful of us who have a job at a Canadian or a university somewhere else who routinely teach and produce research on Canadian slavery. Literally, there's probably four or five of us at the moment. So how are we going to produce the next generation of scholars if we're not in the university with access to undergrads, MAs, and PhDs? Right. So that's where too, the Institute becomes really crucial to bring the scholars and the artists together so that they can interact with each other one day, hopefully face to face. Right. And so like to to um, accelerate then the generation of this research. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank and just a little a, a little bit of a fangirl moment and then I'll stop. I want to thank you for the work that you did with Adrienne Johnson because her essay that you published in I think your most Words recent and, edited collection. Words in African Canadian Art History. Okay. I've, I've included into my modern art curriculum and it has mm -hmm. been such a popular essay among students in, in their assignments and their responses. So it, it really has been instrumental in, in the introduction of, of Canadian content into how I teach modern art. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question, Jacqueline. Um, I see that Lee Rodney just submitted something. Uh, thank you for such an amazing talk. Um, I'm wondering to what extent discussions around creolization are happening in Canadian history departments. It's mm. fascinating that these avenues are being opened up by you in art history, but I also wonder how art related scholarship is still seen as not being central enough to move the important questions forward. Thank you, Lee. Right. Thank you, Lee. So uh, that's a great question, Lee. I think most of the time when um, these concerns are being raised in history departments or say anthropology departments, they're being raised precisely as I've argued here around um, the same kind of biases of, as mints. It's like, OK, we want to talk realization. We have to go to the tropics. We have to find a place that had plantations and we have to find the places where the slave ships showed up right from Africa. So when these conversations are being raised, they're typically not raised in the context of a place like Canada. It doesn't even strike people as something that you could possibly do. And I think uh, here's the thing too, Lee, that we have to understand. A lot of the scholars working on transatlantic slavery who work on the American South, the Caribbean, and again, northern parts of South America, they don't know that slavery happened in Canada. 
That's how bad it is. So, and here's the thing, it's our fault. It's it's a fault of Canada and Canadians because if we don't know as Canadians, how's the rest of the world supposed to know, right? Who's gonna tell the rest of the world that we practiced slavery for 200 years under two empires? So here's the, so that's part of it too, right? So when I go to lecture in the USA, for instance, uh, for, first of all, there's amazement that like she's talking about Canada, but then the interesting thing is that, the, you know, the American audience has really pushed my research forward rather quickly because they have a very basic or a high understanding of slavery. When I lecture in Canada, I often get stuck at the level, and this is fine, but I get stuck at really, um, let's say, questions of what are you talking about? <laughs> Why didn't I learn this in school? I'm 60 years old and I've never heard about this until you gave me this lecture. So I get stuck in that moment as opposed to people asking me things like, let's talk about Joe's work in the printing office or let's like dig down and theorize creolization. That doesn't happen by and large in my Canadian lectures. So that's interesting too. But Lee, I think to your point, um, I think we'd find that Canadian academics and history departments are talking about creolization, but they're talking about it in terms of uh, the Black diaspora in the tropics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I don't have my camera on. It's been a long day, but <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking about um, uh, Irene Moore Davis's work here in uh, the Windsor, Detroit area, and the interest in talking about um, transnational migration and the Black uh, communities in the Windsor, Detroit region, okay. um, and. I don't I don't have a fully formed question around this, but I'm just really struck by the disciplinary differences in terms of the way mm -hmm. the, the ways in which the, the questions are posed in, mm -hmm. you know, in history, which seems to get really, really narrow or can get very narrow with, with, with some with some exceptions, of course. Mm -hmm. And then um, the work that you've been doing in terms of. Um, you know, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just fascinating to me that. I've heard more in visual culture and art history um, coming forward in, in Britain and the US and, well, now Canada, <laughs> uh, but not as much specifically in Canadian history departments. I think that's really what we right. make. Um, right, right. I mean, I'm, I'm still learning a lot about what's, um, being written about in in Windsor and Detroit or the the, the kind of trans border region, um, but mm -hmm. uh, but it's it seems like it's a a newer area of scholarship, um, I, you know maybe thirty years or so, but still like it's very active at the moment. So yeah. So do you mean the the study of Canadian slavery is newerly, or the study um, of civilization in that context of the U.S. Canada border? I'm thinking more about Tia Miles' work. Um, on Detroit, um, and and uh, then and on the Windsor side, um, uh, you know the idea of, of Windsor being a kind of um, French frontier and okay. the French, um, uh, French approach to slavery, <laughs> which right. uh, has been you know that that was really exciting, well, really interesting research mm -hmm. for me to read um, with with Tia Miles' work on on. Uh, what's it called? The Dawn of Detroit, that, that particular book. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think the landscape, yeah, there's a lot of fissures, if you will, in how slavery and Black diaspora are studied. And one major one is what discipline are you in? And um, here's the thing, our historians, you can probably tell by how I work, our historians read everything, mm -hmm. right? I read history, I read anthropology, I read Black diaspora studies, I read African American studies, I read, you know? So whereas Historians, I find, like, love you, art, his, love you, historians, but you often use art and visual culture uh, as what you assume to be transparent documents that need no explanation, whereas art historians are like, no, everything, <laughs> who, who made it, how did it circulate, who paid for it, like, how many hands touched it, like, we have all these questions around the object. So when I come in, you know, Lee, why I'm so interested in the ads, I should back up and tell you all. When I was working on my 2016 book on Montreal, Jamaica and landscapes, I was also looking at newspapers and I kept finding these ads, these ads. And then if you've ever seen a slave sale ads, it's completely different than the fugitive ads I've shown you tonight. The slave sale ads are very short usually, and they give almost no description of the person being sold because why do I need to describe them? Because 
I'm just trying to tell you about their labor or skills and um, that they're healthy and obedient, right? So, so most of those ads too don't even have the name of the enslaved person being sold. So I'd come across those, um, the fugitive ads, and I was like, wait a second. As an art historian, I'm like, what is actually happening with the text? The text is visual. You, no one would ever have caught Joe if they didn't have the ability to translate the text into a visual image in their head, see some man on the street and say, I think that is Joe. So the little icon in some of the ads at the side is not the portrait. That's just a, an icon saying, this is a fugitive ad. Someone's running away. The text is the portrait. And the portrait, for art historians, of course, this is a very important genre in the 17th, 18th through to today even, but especially in the 18th and 19th century. But these are, are what makes them so dubious, of course, is they're stolen likenesses. These people who are fleeing did not want to be represented. So we can look at these things, too, as a precursor to the mugshot. Right. And, does, right? and disturbingly, Lee, here's, the, here's where it just kicks you in the gut. Listen, when the photography gets developed, those places that still have slavery, like Brazil, Cuba, and USA, start to use photographs in these ads. Mm, wow. How disturbing is that? So, so this would have been late 19th century then? Right. So, so yeah. the USA doesn't stop slave, slavery until the Civil War is won by the North, 1865. Mm -hmm. So, of course, photography is invented in the 1830s. Brazil right. stops in 1888. Cuba stops in 1886. Yeah. Right. So the, they still have some text, of course, in the ads, but then there are places and newspapers that start to print a photo of the enslaved people. So think about that, too, as 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 technologies of hyper surveillance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. That we're still very they're working well for the slave owners in the period I'm talking about too, pre photography, because people are getting caught all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, of course, they're incentivizing you to help catch Joe. Why? Because you're going to get some money. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, so this wow. is really layered. And yeah. But for me, I see them as, of course, um, portraits, unauthorized portraits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. And I'm going to look for that book. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And if, obviously, we've just scratched the surface of this really important work. Um, you know, when you talked about sort of what um, movies we've seen about slavery and sort of I ran through the list and I, thankfully I didn't go to Gone with the Wind as my first choice um, <laughs> but Book of Negroes it was made into a TV movie and that I think what's interesting about the Canadian story about slavery is that we're seen as the good guys because we ended slavery earlier and so the prevailing mythology that we try to pat ourselves at the back with is that well the Americans had slaveries and, and Canada was a place to be free. For oh. sure, Lydia. And you know what else? The heroine of Lawrence Hill's book, then um, a miniseries, when she goes to Nova Scotia, she's one of the black so-called refugees, which a term that I refuse because, you know, she's a black loyalist who gets her freedom and gets sent to Nova Scotia. So her the story that gets, gets tracked there is of a free black in Nova Scotia, not of an enslaved black in Nova Scotia, right? And yeah. then if you think of 12 Years a Slave, who's Brad Pitt at the end of the movie? He's the white Canadian who shows up and actually he's the one who facilitates Northrop's freedom by getting the message to his family and friends in the North that he's been kidnapped. There you have it. That's yeah, what we no, do. It's, it's, <laughs> it's really true because we're always seen as, as the good guys. Like the, our, our mythology is that we, we, mm -hmm. we know, yeah, maybe we had slaves, but it was for a minute. Like you told me 200 years. It's like, I didn't know it was 200 years. Like yeah. you, got some, you got some explaining to do. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> we say it's for a minute and we say somehow that less enslaved people meant they were treated better. I always say to people, how did you come up with that? Yeah. Please tell me, like Joe suffered a trauma of isolation. Imagine, like, imagine that Joe probably, could, could he even, we have to ask, could he even find someone to speak his language to if yeah. he recalls his language, right? So we have to think about the other types of trauma that ensued compared to let's say the enslaved person in New Orleans, who as horrible slavery is, they know that on a Sunday they can find their people at Congo Square, right? What did that mean to them to be able to go find their people, speak their language, practice their dancing, vocal, you know, vocality, their singing? Joe would not have had that. The Creole blacks in, in Quebec City would not have had that. 
Yeah. Well, again, I thank you so much. Thank I'm you. so happy that you were able to to be our keynote speaker for this week. And uh, I want to thank you and Fredoza for introducing you and running the chat and dealing with our technology. And I, I really want to thank our audience for being with us. Uh, you know, I'm hoping by by the spring we'll be back in person. But for now, we are um, we are certainly happy to do this virtually. And uh, and before I let everyone go, I just want to remind you that Humanities Week has actually just begun. Um, so just uh, uh, FYI, tomorrow at noon, we have a talk with Dr. Julie Long Young, which is I Crossed the Border, I Didn't Make a Crime, which is building a counter archive of the Canada-US border. On Thursday, and that's at noon tomorrow, on Thursday at one o'clock, we've changed the time on every single one, and we're just <laughs> going to keep you on your toes. So on Thursday at one, we have, we're featuring a conversation with Erin Shields. She's the playwright of If We Were Birds, which is the current show being put on by university players. And then we're going to end the week on Friday with a trivia event where students can test their knowledge of the humanities and get a chance to win some gift cards. Uh, at the end, we'll be announcing the winner of the 2021 Why Humanities Contest. And our theme this year is Why Humanities Matter in a Post-Pandemic World. You still have time to enter the contest as it closes at noon on Wednesday. So once again, thank you so much, Charmaine, and thank you everyone for attending. And I look forward to seeing you all back tomorrow at noon. Bye.